so next up, we're going to have Shelly Stahl. Shelly is with AGU, where she is the director of data programs. Thank you. And, um, and also PI on the FAIR, Enabling FAIR Data Project, which hosted a workshop on Monday pre-ESIP. And Shelly's going to give us an update on recent activities. Thanks, Shelly. I am. Okay. That's. And we can switch. Yep. It... Like up here. Yes. Yep. Got you. Just as long as you're All right. Here. Connor, you're awesome. All right. It's a little warm in here, guys. <laughs> What's with that? Um, <clears throat> so I'm getting over cold. This is the water. So forgive me if I have to turn and cough a little bit. Um, all right. And I also had another presentation this morning, so I, I, I'm also, I didn't mean to be MIA on you. Um, I was down the hall. Uh, who, uh, has anyone here and uh, not heard of the Enabling Fair Data Project? I'm, I'm kind of hoping there's a few hands. Couple, three? Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. So, so the fact that I put in some extra slides is probably going to be valuable. And for those who have heard about it, feel free to nod, smile widely, and don't fall asleep on me. Okay, got it? Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce you to AGU's new branding for our, our centennial, AGU 100. Is this not beautiful? They did a great job. So if we're being recorded, we'll clip this and I'll send it to our marketing folks so that they know how excited you are. Um, it's, it's really pretty, actually. I, literally, I saw this for the first time this morning when Brooke sent me slides for the other presentation. I'm like, wow, that looks awesome. I think I'll use that. Um, so I am our director of data programs, and that just means that anything that has the word data in it, I get to be part of, um, and that's exciting. So let me tell you about life. Uh, I'm telling you about life. There we go. Okay. Uh, the reason I am at AGU, so I'm not a publisher. I don't do community so, uh, so, uh, society building. I'm not part of our engagement group. I don't do meetings. I do data. Um, and I came from the non-science space. I am not a scientist. Uh, but I am, I do have an MBA. I do have a math degree. And I have gobs of certifications in being brilliant with data. Um, and that's why AGU thought that I would be a great addition to their group. So I am, I was immersed into science. Brooks, when he hired me, said, look, the most important thing for you to do is learn science. Okay, sounds good. Um, so my brother's a geologist, um, looks just like Ethan, in case you want to know what my brother looks like. And my dad is an earth and space science teacher. Um, so all of our trips were going to the national parks and looking at the landscape and learning where all of the rocks and the sediments are. So I did have a really interesting, and I told AGU that in my letter to ask to, to work there, that I had this background and they thought that was fantastic. So there you go. There's, there's my science. Um, and I have immersed myself in the Geological Society of Washington and I do participate in those meetings and uh, enjoy our science. So we have a position statement at AGU, and is Ruth here? No? Okay. So Ruth was instrumental along with, Ruth Dorr was instrumental along with others in the last version of our position statement. We've had it since the 1990s, um, and uh, every decision we make uh, within AGU considers this position statement. Earth and Space Sciences data is a world heritage. Uh, the, the observations we have on the Earth in space um, the different events that take place, these are unique events. You cannot recreate this data. Uh, therefore, we need to care for it uh, very well. So the work we do, the work I do, this is the base. This is when we make a decision, are we caring for the data well? Uh, so let me kind of orient you on this Enabling Fair Data Project. There's some numbers that came out of uh, a Belmont Forum. Uh, if you don't know the Belmont Forum, please do. They're a funder. <laughs> Good to know them. Uh, and they they're international and they represent 25 different organizations and actually NSF is one of those organizations. Um, and this, this was a survey done with researchers uh, and uh, it was really valuable uh, information validating what we thought was true. So, so uh, uh, the challenges that researchers have with using data, uh, so 20.1% 20, 20 was data complexity. So yeah, that's kind of, um, you know, ambiguous a little bit, but if you think of how hard it is to understand what you're looking at um, when you're doing cross-domain work, so so things to help them navigate, maybe visualizations, so that, that's kind of where that one sits. 19.5% um, is lack of data standards and exchange standards. So this is, this. I, I would argue that probably the question was wrong, um, that from our point of view, it's standard implementation of those standards. We have 
jobs of standards. It's not really lack, it's really implementation. So not really an argument here, but from the researcher's point of view, they're challenged with understanding what standards are and, and, and how their role is. Um, and then uh, the next two are some of my, my, my favorites is 17.1% uh, of finding relevant existing data. Oh my gosh, discovery. Okay, so there we are. How do we discover this data? Um, and then data management and storage. Do we have a place for our data? Do we know how to manage it? We don't have standard um, uh, training for researchers as they're coming through bachelor's and graduate work. Um, that's, that's not good. We need to fix that. All right. Uh, fair guiding principles. If you've not seen this yet, if you want a sticker, I've got them in my bag. Um, so, so this is a, a really important uh, uh, solidifying paper that came out in Nature in 2016. Uh, and it was uh, started by an international group of folks. Force 11 had huge uh, uh, support on this, along with many other organizations. Um, and where FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And the idea is you take the elements that are part of this paper, apply it to your community, and try to improve what's happening. And we really thought this was a great, uh, a great uh, area to, to focus on. So we're using FAIR as um, uh, kind of a, a guide for this project we're working on. <coughs> All right, so, so gut punch, okay. So I'm, I'm teaching at the student conference. I, I did this last year, but the year before, 2016, and this had just come out, and I'm trying to come up with, um, so keeping in mind, I know they don't have enough data management education, and I wanna help them understand why this is important. So um, this couldn't have been better timed. It was like the day I was working on the slides, this came out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what they need to hear. So Jeremy Berg, who's the editor-in-chief over in science, he puts an editorial expression of concern. So you're familiar with microplastic particles, right? This is important science. Um, we need to understand what's happening in the waters, what's happening to the fish, what's happening to the wildlife. Um, and so he says, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, the authors of the paper said the laptop was stolen. Well, my, what do you mean? Where's the data on the laptop? You mean it's nowhere else? No, it's not. All the data was on a laptop. Uh, what? What? Why? It's science. How did that happen? They have policies to make sure that data is in the right place. Well, they they're they're not tied down. There's ways to get around these policies, and that's true at AGU as well. Uh, although, boy, is it getting tied down fast right now. I'm telling you what. Um, uh, so it happened. It happened. And I'm explaining to these these early career scientists, these students. You cannot be in a story like this. You cannot do this. This is not going to be your legacy. So listen to me. You have to have better data management. And I, I am here for you. Not one of them called me. There's 300 of them. Um, then it got worse. So the, editor, the ethical review board um, took a look at the paper um, and it, there was a retraction. There we found three significant elements. Our, that's horrible, right? How did we do this? Um, and uh, uh, one of them was the absence of the data. Um, and thank you to the Ethical Review Board for knowing that that's critical. Um, and uh, again, this, this article has to never happen, ever. This has got to be the last time. This is it. We, this cannot happen again. This is not good for our science. It's not good for our community. We need to fix this. Okay. So we did. We're going to. We're on the way. And um, uh, across all of the entire ecosystem, every journal, every earth and space size journal out there, we are going, we are working with. And in order for data to be well cared for, it has to be in a repository, uh, not a supplement. So uh, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation agreed. They said, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, we completely agree and we're going to fund the project. And we we're like, oh, thank you so much. Um, and it's a quick project, uh, 18 months, and we are 13 months to go. And the reason it's quick, where's Leslie? Leslie has given us a, a moniker. We're, she's calling us the Green Project. I think this is fantastic. We are not building anything new. We are recycling and reusing. Yes, we are. We are implementing existing things that are out there that are brilliant and just need someone to grab them and adopt them. 
A um, couple things we have to kind of figure out, but we are not going to build a new thing. Um, we, are, we are going to have a uh, set of elements that we have found across the community, and many of you have participated and shared uh, what you think are good solutions to the pieces of the puzzle that are going to make this happen. It's going. It's a. It's an incredible relationship across publishers and journals and repositories. There are more than 300 Earth and Space Science repositories, repositories that have Earth and Space Science internationally. That's a lot of people, and we don't want to lose one of them. We want to keep them all because the folks that have the curation services that are making sure the metadata is most understandable are commonly the ones with the most dubious funding, um, meaning that they don't have long-term funding, they have short-term funding, and we need them. They have the skill sets, they understand the domain data, and um, we they have to be in the fold. We have to hang on to them. So, yay. Uh, here's the objectives. We've put these out in different formats. This This text comes directly from the last EOS article we put out, uh, the outcome from the stakeholder meeting, and um, Aaron Robinson actually crafted these too. So the, so they're, so the, of the ilk, um, so fair compliant data repositories, fair compliant earth and space science publishers. So from the repository side, um, we need help making sure the metadata is in good shape, or you need help making sure we have uh, citation support with landing pages, um, and the, the metadata for discovery that comes from that, uh, support to the researchers uh, and uh, the curation data management to make sure the metadata is robust. On the, on the publisher side, wouldn't it be nice if every publisher handled data in the same way and that you had to, you didn't have to figure out what this publisher did compared to somebody else? Here we are, we're gonna make it common. Um, so, so the way a publisher handles data will be common. Uh, they're looking for a citation, not the supplement. Here's the key. The data will not go in a supplement or buried in the paper. We're done with that. It's going to be a reference with a citation, description within the data availability statement, and it will resolve to a repository that knows what it means to house data. Um, and actually, um, we have a working group trying to define what those words, what the to know exactly what that is. Um, we're really excited about this. I mean, like over the top excited. <laughs> Running like, I got my track shoes on. Um, we are into, uh, we, we've just finished up with our, our January 8th workshop. We're gonna have another one at RDA Berlin. You are all welcome to come. It will be March 18th in Potsdam. So if you're coming to RDA, just add a couple days on and join us. Um, we, this will be a very solidifying workshop where um, we will have come to kind of to the end of what we're doing and starting to document exactly what those recommendations and policies are. You can also be part of the review process of those documents. If you're not already on my incredibly massive manual, yes, there's no automation. This is not an AGU branded thing. Shelly's doing this on her own. Um, uh, uh, you have to send me a note and I'll get you on there. However, Lynn Yarmy, who's our project manager, um, we have a partnership with RDA. Uh, Lynn Yarmy's helping. Um, we're going to uh, move the lists over to RDA and you'll be able to take yourself on and off the lists and you won't have to send a note to Shelly, which by the way, I can't wait for Lynn to get a chance to do that. So real soon. But meanwhile, send me a note, I'll add you. <clears throat> Uh, April 20th is tattooed on my arm. This is the date where everything has to come together and we look at it as a whole. We have uh, from April to July, we're gonna test it. I don't know what that means. I don't know if we're gonna do a technical test. I don't know if it's a desk check test, but it's gonna be a test so that when we're finished, everyone believes we can do this. So um, we've got journals who have already signed up to help with the test. We have repositories that have already signed up to help with the test. Um, we need to, uh, that part of what we have to figure out is what does that mean to test? So um, an upcoming topic at an upcoming meeting, we will, we will hit that one. And then a, the second stakeholder meeting will be in July-ish. Um, and the idea, it, it, assuming it's gonna be our AGU, renovated AGU building. So the moment that renovation finishes, I'll, uh, I'll know when our meeting's gonna be. Um, I'll know ahead of time. As soon as they have a date for the final finalization. Right now it's March, April, which kind of probably means May, right? 
right? It's construction. <laughs> it's probably May. So as soon as they know exactly, then I'll go ahead and set up the, the date, but it's likely to be about July. Um, and that's when we always say, okay, this is how we're going to implement. Are we all in? Do we have to tweak anything, our methodology? And we'll come up with a schedule. There'll be transition. Um, and I don't know what that means yet. We're figuring that out. But I, you know, by the time I update CDF again, I hopefully will know a little bit more of what, what that means. All right. Lots of people are all in. This is fantastic. So um, ESIP and RDA are teaming together. They're going to help with the governance going forward because when the grant is done, we step back and it has to live within the community. This is a community-driven solution. This is not something AGU is saying. We are convening. We are bringing the community together to figure out what all of these things are. Um, and Council for Data Facilities matters here. We The 418 project, which I, I apologize for not having heard Doug talk, but we know the elements within that project are part of the importance of discovery of data. And we are um, uh, intending, uh, the, the working group's still working, so I'm not saying we are, but we are intending to recommend uh, what's happening within 418 as part of our project. Um, publishers are all in, all of the big publishers are in. Um, PNAS, they're, they're a little nervous. They're more conservative than most. Their transition, um, I would not be surprised, has a possibly longer trajectory than the rest of us. But everyone else is already there. They're already thinking it. They just need the community to help them implement. Um, and we're, we're going to do it. We're going to push. We're going to go. Um, and then we have, um, uh, you know, the repositories through the Coptus work that's been done that Kirsten, Kirsten Leonard has done with Brooks, um, uh, Coptus being the Coalition on Publishing Data in Earth and Space Sciences, started in 2014. They have a statement of commitment. The journals, most of the leading repositories, they're, they're in um, as part of that community. They're aware of what's going on. Um, <coughs> of course, concerned to make sure that they, they, so once they get the documents and can see what the actual implementation is, um, we do have funding in the project to help repositories meet criteria. And tag uh, the tag for the repositories is actually helping us figure out through an inventory they're building what that delta is. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Australia came in hard. Thank you, Leslie. She pulled them all in and said, you people are part of this. And they provided letters of support to the Arnold Foundation. So the National Computational Infrastructure, OSCOPE, and the Australian National Service, National Data Service, Center for Open Science, of course, was thrilled. So Brian Nozick is on our steering committee. Um, data site thinks this is fantastic. Orchid is all in. Crossref is in. Chorus is in with Howard, uh, Howard Ratner and Scalix. We uh, they can see the value of making sure we have connectivity and support data and finding data. If you don't know what any of these are, look them up. These are all really important entities, and we keep adding. There's more. I need lots of slides at this point. Um, so general thinking here, um, uh, I use the data one uh, life cycle. I happen to like it. There's a lot of life cycles I like, so it's not that I'm you know, picking favorites, but maybe I am. Um, so the point here is the best time to get your data all organized is not when you're publishing, right? That's kind of at the end. We know that. This isn't optimal. What we're hoping is we're going to drive the life cycle such that the when you're putting your data management together, plan together, when you are designing your, your research, you know that you're going to have to meet the criteria of the publisher and that you're going to do a better job at caring for your data. So the folks that are at the top of the circle, please, we need your help to support. Um, we need to make sure that the requirements that are coming out of the institutions, out of the funders, out of the organizations that are supporting the researchers are all saying the same thing. And I know they are already, but we're going to resonate that hard. Um, so it's not optimal where we are on this, on this life cycle, but it's going to be important. Um, that's really the point of this slide. Okay. Got to have a cartoon, right? Um, so this came out of RDA, I think 2014. I think, I don't know if Mark's here to nod his head and double check for me. Uh, they had a cartoonist come in and try to capture some really salient points from that session. And this one, this one really hits home. Uh, data is a first class research product, right? But there's a garbage can. Um, it's not, it's really not. We don't have it set up that way, but this is what we want to fix. So this is my change to the cartoon. We, we, data has to be part of the research products. It has to be findable and discoverable on its own. It has to um, be able to be understood by folks outside your domain. Um, and the, the bullet points highlight that. So this is, this is the piece here. 
uh, the curation matters, the repositories matter. And essentially what we're saying is, so the publishers have this role, they've had it for over 100 years, AG is gonna be 100, so it's over 100 years. We have to care for the scientific record. You are documenting your research in a publication. That's how it works. And if we're saying that the data is no longer supposed to be inside the publication, it's supposed to be in a repository, and it's critical to understand the research, we're saying the repositories are part of the scientific record. So we want you to, un the value of a repository is significant, and we're saying it out loud, and we're gonna force it to happen. So there you are. That's how important the Council for Data Facilities is. We, you matter here in what we're doing. Uh, and to understand the work that's gonna come your direction, here's a fantastic slide. I'll describe it to you. I know you can't read it. So PLOS One, broad science, so not just Earth and space, but it's a good number. It's, it'll, it'll shake your boots plenty. Um, their policy, their data policy came into play in 2014. And so the, the top of the bar is the number of publications <coughs> per year. So um, this year we've got just over 20,000 publications, looks like about 22,000. So the dark blue in the bottom right where the circle is, that's the, the, for every paper, this isn't volume of data, this is the data associated with a paper, where is it? And the dark blue is a repository, about 20%. Um, the thin line above it is um, uh, protected data, legal and ethically protected data, where we're looking for metadata to be available, but of course the data is protected, um, access control. And then above that is uh, data that's in the paper, either in the supplement or embedded in the, in the paper itself. So this is a supply and demand problem we're looking at right here. We're gonna push that 20% into the high 90s for the earth and space sciences. We don't have that much protected data really when you look at the volumes, it's very small. So um, uh, we're, gonna push, we're gonna push work at you. What that means for this group is I need to understand if there is a way, and this, this is something I'm, I'm gonna look at Danny and I don't, I don't think Tim's here, um, but they're uh, co-chairs um, uh, and, and Michael Witt also, um, are there tools that can help the intake ingest process for a repository, thinking kind of generic, but I'm not sure what the answer is here, that can reduce that some of the front load admin work so that you have the ability to expand. I know many of you think very hard on this because you're always looking to optimize. So I'd like to help, I'd like to understand better. And if there's a way this project can help you, I want to do that. I want to do that, but I don't quite have a good understanding yet. So this is my ask to you. How can we figure out a way to reduce that workload so that you can, in fact, then work with more researchers? What is that? Um, and I, I don't mind hearing negative. I, 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 need a, I need a real level set here. I'm not sure what I'm asking. Um, you are the experts. I am not. Uh, and so the bullets there, um, no data in a supplement, we're going fair, yay, yay. There's a lot of players. This is meant to be the ecosystem representing all of the different overlaps. We have unique uh, uh, goals and objectives within each of, the different, um, each of the different stakeholder communities. This project is focusing on the re relationship between the publisher, the repository, and the researcher, and, and the bulk of the work is being done with the publisher and the repository. So most of you have already leapt to the point that we're not thinking a whole lot on the researcher side. Not quite, uh, we are, but we have to be a little careful because the scope of our grant is the publisher repository, but the stakeholders working on the project work directly with the researchers. So we do have work happening um, with training and with culture change within, the, within our effort. Um, uh, we just have to be a little careful on the scope of the grant and how we're doing that. So, the, so we do have support there. Um, we're just a little, we have to be cautious how we talk about it. Um, so ideas on incentives for researchers, oh boy. 
all of them. Just please send them my way. Um, there's a there's a working group. Um, Denise Hills and Reed Boehm are the co-chairs of the Culture Change Working Group. Ideas that you have, contacts that we can make. We pretty much want to say to everyone who has influence over a researcher, and just imagine that list, right? Heads and chairs, um, you know, over and over and over. There's a, all the high-level folks that have influenced the National Academies. Um, I did, I did a, a, a talk with them. We need, we need support for making data a first-class research product. It has to, you have to get credit for it. It has to be part of your promotion and tenure. And any incentive you can think of, we want to hit home. Uh, this, you can take a picture of this. You can have these slides. <laughs> um, this is where all of the reference materials are. So the first two are EOS articles, an orientation uh, article, and then the outcomes from the stakeholder meeting that was held in September, or uh, right, November. Um, and then uh, thank you to Data One. I know there's folks from Data One here. They uh, allowed me to uh, kick off their webinar series this this season, um, and they let me talk about enabling fair data. So that's a really great recording to take a look at. And then the last one is the coptest.org, our general uh, project location. So you can go there and get caught up also on, on what the projects are, project is. Here's the working groups. We call them tags. So remember, this is a green project. We reuse and recycle. So we adopt, we don't create. So they name themselves targeted adoption groups. Fantastic, right? I like it. Um, so repositories, um, Danny's co-chair along with Michael Witt. We've got publishers, Elsevier and PLOS are leading that. I love it, I love it. They just, they're just take that community. They're like, let's go. Um, and the training folks, Nancy Hobelheimrich, I just, I just left down the hall and John Petters from Virginia Tech. Um, tag E is, this one is complicated. Um, data and DOI workflows. So when the DOI gets registered, and when you cite it within your publication, uh, the status of the two matter. And so uh, understanding what that dance is and what the different possibilities are, it's a really big deal. Um, and we're just now moving forward with that tag. It took them a little while to get their feet on the ground because it's complicated. Um, and then the culture change folks, Denise Hills and Reed Boehm. Um, and then our untag, Raleigh's here for our untag. I added un, did you see that? Um, uh, I, essentially, uh, the active data management plans, and thanks, thanks to the National Science, Science Foundation for supporting this effort. There's, there's a couple different, um, and Kirsten's here too. So, so the active data management plans. Um, Kirsten has a project going on with Aida, which is really important, and um, the other group is Stephanie Sims at CDL. Um, so we believe we have a really interesting, important connection with this project, but they have no. Um, uh, uh, deliverables for us. It's a liaison, and Raleigh's doing the liaison work, um, and we're we're glad to do that. Um, and we do agree that there's connection there. Uh, alrighty. So this slide came out of Monday's meeting, and uh, it's something that I'm still absorbing because Joel uh, Kutcher Gershenfeld put it together as we were doing the meeting, and it's his synthesis. Um, <coughs> mm, cold. Um, so, so this is, on the right-hand side, before we pulled everybody in, I, I, I put together a matrix of all the different elements the project was going to need. So kind of just generic statements. We're going to need some, some, we need to understand metadata better. We need to get our arms around persistent identifiers. We need to understand landing pages better. So those are the bullets. Um, some scrutiny was on the list, so it's, it's okay. It was a good start. Um, and I shared it with uh, with Joel, so he kind of understood what all of the pieces of the puzzle were that we needed to get our arms around. We needed to have some sort of a, a statement about understanding what's in, what's out. Um, and so, so those are the elements associated with the repositories. And very commonly, there's overlap into what the journals are doing. So the citation policies will matter to you. Um, repository use policies, that matters, right? We want the repositories to tell the journal that answer. We don't want the journals to tell the repositories. That's a really important thing to say out loud. The journals should do what they do best. The repositories should do what they do best. And what's possible has to be said by both separately. So really, the repository use um, is going to be heavily influenced by the repository community. Um, OK, so that's, that's good enough for this. So the whole point of what Joel was doing was to help the folks in the room understand all of the, how, the, how the different deliverables coming out of the tags. So here's how he did that. Um, and, and this is, call this a draft because I, I, 
what I'd like to do following this week is try to add in the rest of the deliverables. There's a lot more than these nine. There's a lot more. Um, but the gist of this is valuable. Um, so look at the bottom. Deliverables facing the researchers, things the researchers will see, where the data repository is the lead. First one is tag A, which is the repository group. <coughs> A and D went together, which is we don't want to lose the fact that we pulled D in. Um, <clears throat> so they're building a, um, a tree on... I don't know if you have the same impression, but coming out of the journal side, I've talked to a lot of editors that can't tell me what repository their community should use. I was surprised by that, but it's a reality. Um, there's a lot of sciences that don't know where they should put their data. Uh, we need to fix that fast, really fast. So this tool, this decision tree, which will end up being a tool, uh, is one we wanna give to researchers, um, let funders use, and let uh, institution use, institutions use as, and journals. We want them all to use the same tool. Um, so, and we, we want it to be uh, not owned by these communities, owned separately by one of the infrastructure folks that can kind of do it you know, um, in a trust, trusted way. Uh, so we're, we're actually looking at RE3 data and data site to help us with this um, because they'll have the authoritative source data within their um, uh, registry of repositories, and um, so we we want the uh, el elements of the repository, which, by the way, links directly into 418, by the way. This is, 418 is going to help with this in that way. Um, uh, so, uh, so if you have an opinion on what this should look like, um, please do reach out to Danny. She's, um, she can help guide or help let you know how it's going. Um, they have a draft of this. It's, uh, it's good. It's really good. <laughs> we have a draft of this as of Monday. Um, then training will be um, in front of the researchers, Nancy Holbeheimrich, um, and uh, 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 well, um, this probably doesn't really belong there. This is this is yeah that that's probably not that we're not giving. There's no deliverable coming out of um, active data management plan. So that that Joel had a misunderstanding there. Okay, so kind of squish that over a little bit. We certainly will encourage data management plans to have the solution for their repositories, but um, we have to be careful on our role there. So just a little, it's not really a deliverable. Um, let's go to the far right. So deliverables facing researchers that the publishers are leading. Um, uh, so submission guidelines, how you're gonna do this, common across all the publishers, fantastic. Uh, uh, train, uh, and there's a there's an RDA working group. So a lot of this is being done elsewhere. ESIP and RDA. Um, ESIP has the data management um, uh, clearinghouse, training clearinghouse that Nancy Hobelheimer is running, which is why she, we want her to be co-chair of our group. <coughs> We're actually co-locating those meetings together. We don't have a new meeting. We all meet with Nancy at her meeting. I like that a lot. Um, and then RDA has an awful lot of work that they're doing, and there's a publisher data policy. Well, it's publisher funder institution data policy working group to have common data policies. They're about to put out their work. We are delighted. It's perfect timing. Um, so that's that's the um, that's the first one. Um, and then the training resources, of course, uh, we'll have publisher training also within uh, the work that Nancy's group is doing. And then peer review policies and practices. Again, TAG B is, is doing that. Um, TAG C really isn't pu publisher leading. Oh, I guess I guess the materials will be publisher leading. Okay, all right, sorry, don't wanna double. We just got this Monday, so forgive me for double checking that. And then down the middle is everybody all in. Um, we, need, we need to have both working. Um, uh, the the how we figure out which repositories can meet all the criteria. If you don't support data citation, I've got a problem. Um, we need you to support data citation. So that's one of the one of the important elements. Um, Lynn, how am I doing on time? How many? 40, 45? Four to five minutes left. Oh, I need to talk much faster then. Um, okay. Uh, right. So those things there. Um, so this is what happened Monday. There were three, uh, it was a repository focused meeting. Um, so we, we wanted to, the journals are doing fine. I, I said, look, you're exempt. You just go, go do your stuff. You're fine. We, let's think more about the repositories. The heavy lift is, is 
really think about it. The journals have to figure out data citation and make sure their editors do what they say. That's, that's it. <laughs> that's, they can handle that. The repositories are like, okay, the work's coming our way. What does that mean? So the heavy lift is on the repository side. Um, so there's, what does it mean to support data citation? That's the first one. Uh, where are you? Um, are you supporting data citation? Where are you in metadata? So there's an inventory that was put together by that working group. Um, and then um, Thor is this dance between the DOI and the journals, and we're talking about it, how the, the article and data are linked together. So there's a group that has already done an awful lot of work that we are, we are taking their outcomes and using them to implement. So I'm gonna very quickly give you information and, and hopefully this, these slides will be available. Okay, so this is the link to the data citation um, roadmap uh, for, for scholarly data repositories. You can also type it in, so it's in a preprint. Um, and these are slides from a presentation given by Martin Fenner um, about it. So there's five elements, these five elements, and we, we won't have a long discussion. I'm just letting you know what was talked about. We agreed that these five elements that are being recommended as required should be included in our recommendations and guidelines. We are not, uh, we are not in alignment on all of them yet. There's still conversation to happen, okay? Um, we agree that these are useful and these are being recommended. So it looks funny when it says, we would like these to be, we'd like to recommend these as recommended. Okay, just, just roll with it. Skip the first one. These are recommended, leave it there. Um, uh, the decision was made to move six into required, that, that it really needs to be for our project required. Um, and of course, the other three, uh, there needs to be some sort of technical solution. But we also want to be cautious that we, yes, schema.org, but um, uh, you know, JSON LD may not be around forever. Um, so, so the way we say it might be a little bit more agnostic and appropriate for going forward. Um, so there you are. Uh, that was a really fantastic conversation. And then we mapped what they were thinking about for data citation to what ESIP has. And we'll, we'll, um, there is a good mapping and um, type is a, is a vocabulary. So really not an issue, but then access time and date, we'll, we'll negotiate and make sure that we have everything in alignment. Um, and then the Thor, the Thor talk, did I skip one? Yeah, the, uh, the inventory, let me tell you about the inventory. It's in development, so I'm not gonna share the inventory with you right now. On Monday, um, the folks that are designing it got an awful lot of feedback, but you will see it in the future when it's ready. And my ask to you is please respond. Um, the information that will come from that is, it will help us know what's the gap between what we're asking for and where you are. And we wanna find money to, to make it go away. So the more you can share, the more we know where everybody is, the more accurate the money ask is going to be. Okay. The the do you remember the when we did the Slido? Yeah. That those questions. They don't get Slido. <laughs> they, you had fun with Slido. They don't get Slido. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whatever that ends up being. Um, so what we did is we walked through each question to see if it was written correctly, if it made sense, and the folks that designed the inventory got a lot of feedback. So what you'll see is, um, and they want to do it as an interview because there's not every, it's, these aren't yes, no answers. These are no, but I'm doing it next week, or no, but I, I do it this way. And those, those answers are okay. Um, so I'm not quite sure if you'll get a, um, a, a survey or if you'll get a, comp, a phone call. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's phone call, so, um, which would be great. And then we'll have to have a conversation on confidentiality of this information because, of course, everyone will be concerned. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that's really clear um, on who gets, who gets access to that data. Uh, uh, right, okay, so we also had the Thor conversation, and I'm just going to skip straight to this slide. Oops, I'm not. So um, this is the back and forth. So time of submission and the uh, how act, how it's accessed and they figured out all the different combinations. So we're gonna use that output. Um, community driven, Coptus, this is our plan, there. <laughs> and don't, don't you love this logo? We are at, um, we're exactly at 10.30, but we're going to do a coffee break. So um, there's time for questions. Yes. And, and I'm I'm available. Um, and any you know, uh, uh, Kirsten, who's on our steering committee, um, can answer questions as well. 
Hi, Shelley. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that the big lift would be on the part of the repositories. Traditionally, the publishers have had, uh, at least in the past, you know, more resources. They've been better funded. So, is there any discussion in terms of how do you kind of assess a contribution on the part of publishers to help, you know, well cover the costs of there, there are some things that we data. do plan to ask the publishers for some help with. Um, however, uh, 300 repositories plus institutions, um, this, this, that's a lot of zeros. Um, so I just need to know what that is, and I will go ask. Yeah. Some things can be done. Um, some things folks have technical support with. We actually have technical support built into the implementation. So if you have a repository that doesn't have a lot of technical support, we plan to have someone available to you. Um, the idea is we will help you get there. We don't want to leave anyone behind. You have the skill sets, the curation capability that has to be in this solution. So, so whatever we end up having as a baseline, it's probably going to be some level thing, um, you know, in, intro and then optimal. And Danny's figuring that all out. Yeah, I know. Yes, you are. And um, um, so, so we, we really want to make sure that as we are transitioning into this, that within the transition window, you can meet at least the baseline requirements. Um, so, so you can infer what they are. You have to support data citation. You have to be able to deal with metadata. Um, we want to make sure that your data is discoverable. So 418 plays a role here. Um, and uh, um, you know, um, if you've thought about core trust seal, this is being batted around a little bit, that would be an optimal solution. So, yeah. Kirsten, come on up. Come on up and ask your question. <clears throat> Looks like the microphone's dying for the folks on the phone. The microphone is dead. Sadness. Come on over. So, I just wanted to add to that discussion of, you know, costs. I think this is a much bigger issue, right, and sustainable uh, data infrastructure and, not, you know, how do we actually ensure that it's not a struggle from three-year grants to three-year grants and, and, and getting the money. And it's it's funny that this came up because just this morning, um, Aaron and Brooks and I had sort of a in, informal discussion where I brought it up that, you know, there has to be at some point consideration for the repositories to actually get funding if they from the publishers maybe because they're taking on <laughs> work and effort responsibilities that the publishers had before. So I think there's going to be a lot of discussions over in, in the future still about how do we make this whole ecosystem and infrastructure sustainable. Uh, there is actually a small workshop um, at, at NSF in two weeks on exactly this topic with a small number of representatives from the different directorates. Uh, it will be interesting to see what, you know, the, the take is there, but I would not, you know, bring this necessarily into the discussion of the FAIR project because it's so much bigger and so much more challenging. It's nothing that we in this project or even within the earth science community can solve right away. That's that's what that would be my take on, on this. Unfortunately. No, I appreciate those comments. I think we all appreciate those comments. And I think there's some implicit understanding that you know, with whatever comes out of the fair as far as recommendations for repositories, that the repositories, in light of what Kirsten said, have a short and long term, you know, internal objectives that are governed by the funding stream now. And so, you know, there's there's that understanding that even if you're looking and your answer is, well, we're going to adopt this tomorrow in two years. Yeah. Yeah. It, we are hoping that there'll be an opportunity for you to go ahead and plan. So the more you know now about what's coming and kind of where you are, and as you're prioritizing your projects, this may influence that, and I'm hoping so, because I, I 
we want you to be part of this solution. Um, and then, you know, the challenges that you have, um, you telling me is useful, but also telling Danny your challenges. Um, she's, uh, you know, I, I don't have my own repository. Danny does. Um, Kerstin too, tell, letting Kerstin know um, the folks that are, are critical, uh, are, are part of the leadership of the project. Um, that's also very helpful. Um, and then we can take those things into consideration on how we, how we design the transition. Um, again, I'll just say this is so incredibly powerful because groups like NSF and in Australia, the equivalent in Europe, fund a lot of research data and it's just evaporating. The big data does end up in repositories. Most of what the repositories have got now is the big data with the exception of Kirsten's. We don't have anything like Kirsten's in Australia that's capturing the, 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 the smaller data. And so this is just so powerful, but it's how we bring it together and please don't bring it together for the US alone because yeah, um, publications and submissions to journals are now international. Yep, and half um, our submissions are from China. Yeah, so. everyone is gonna say we are just in Australia so far behind what you guys have in this Council for Data Facilities. Um, it's just how do we bring it together and money to fund this is so scarce. Can we actually internationalize it so that we work out what has to be done and then how do we implement it? Um, I don't know where to go, but yeah. We, we Repositories already, to yeah. me hold the key and it's something that slipped off all the funding people. A lot of the data that gets submitted to journals sits on people's C drives or USB drives. It's getting that out of the darkness and into the repositories. And right now, nobody's really funding that. So, so for this project, it's the funding is a Delta funding. Get you to where you need to be. It does not resolve sustainability. Just, just kind of to let you know, I, we, I can't take the whole scope of that. But we have, um, we have talked to all of the major uh, private funders. We've talked to U.S. funders like NSF, um, uh, NOAA, and NASA, and USGS from the government side. Um, there, uh, for the for NOAA, NASA, and USGS, uh, they have the PAR requirements that came out of OSTP to influence that. So a lot, a lot of requiring open data and data citation, that those pieces are in better shape. Um, and then on the international side, um, folks are, are helping me understand what the EU is up to to see if we can figure out how to tap in there. Um, but yeah, well, it's an international solution. Thanks. Are there any any other questions for Shelley? I think we're rolling into. Oh yeah. And, and if you want to have a longer conversation, I, I'm more than we'll happy take one more to set something up. Um, so this is kind of an open question, so maybe no need to respond right now, but. Um, talk about this in the break. So, um, Shelley, you've mentioned often there's going to be a greater burden on repositories. And I just wonder from the repository's perspective, how much of that is the kind of technical implementation, both the specific added demands for citation and so on, and how much just more infrastructure to accommodate the larger amounts of data. And then how much of it is the increased curation requirements because there'll be more data sets. And then how much of it is the kind of user outreach to um, scientists who are increasingly coming to the repositories with their data. So just like, I know there's this bigger burden. I'm just curious where the burden lies in particular, if it's all of the above. That, that's a great bullet list. I mean, some will be short term for technical um, technical uh, refresh to get to, get to a, a standard. Um, and then the rest is going to be ongoing. So, so yes and yes, and yes, please have that conversation. Let's have that conversation. Yeah, and, and yes, I'm I'm nervous about general repositories. I, I have that's a whole animal right there. How do we deal with that? Because they have to be part of the solution too. There won't be there won't be enough repositories with the services necessary for researchers to support all the researchers. They're going to have to go to a general repository um, at least now, and we'll we'll see if we can continue to improve that and reduce those numbers so they get the services that they need. But that is a that is like probably the biggest problem in my mind is how do we deal with that? All right, thanks, Shelley. Yep. Um, and see, Shelley, if you have any more questions, don't forget to tip your. Um, 
And Lynn's got the sign-up sheet. If anybody came in a little late or hasn't signed it yet, please, please give us your autograph. And uh, thanks, Lynn. <laughs> thanks for that reminder. And uh, so we have we're supposed to have a coffee break until eleven. We kind of went over a little bit, but hopefully everybody will get a bio break and something to drink. See you at eleven. <laughs>